Hello everyone, today we talk about the Decretals collections followed to the Decretum Graziani. And you would say, what the hell are the Decretals? But you know, of course, this is something on which, uh, you know, uh, half of Western political theory, juridical production, cultural development uh, rested for, for centuries. Um, and they're, you know, uh, of course, connected to the broader process of the Gregorian reforms that were expressed during the 12th century, so at the moment, which effectively it had achieved, also international institution had been recognized as, you know, successful, especially uh, in Italy, but gradually expanding, especially during the 13th century, in a way that, uh, as you know, in, uh, ecclesiastically wise, would be um, fundamentally hegemonic. Right, then effectively things contract in the 14th century, and 15th century again, then the Reformation occurred. But, you know, this all passed through, obviously, um, an extraordinary civilizational output represented um, and enacted and functioning through the rich normative production of the Church, right? realized especially through the papal Decretals, the, the decrees, the, 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 the papal decrees, right? So the, the popes, the Gregorian reform fundamentally had claimed and, you know, the, the, the superiority and the, and the truth fundamentally and any of their statement in matters of faith, of course, but also in matters of, you know, of, um, you know, the, 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 the secular interaction, let's say, uh, between the church and, in fact, the, the empire, first of all, and the, the, other, the other authorities, um, that you know, were imposed as also the primary source of the renewal of canonic law that had, of course, uh, been uh, the, the main instrument, as the Church, as you know, didn't... Yes, it was a, a you know, powerful seigniory, you can argue, principality if you prefer. It had lands, armies, and so on, but not in the measure of being, like, a, a major power, right? So the, all this was achieved because of the charisma of the authority of the spiritual primacy of the Church of Rome, um, and of course the the enormous leverage that such uh, such actor could have in the very complex and also naturally fragmented European reality of the time. And we talked about the decretum the other time, so we've seen that the canonic law is essentially the, the ecclesiastical law uh, that is modeled on, on the law of nature, right? There is something in common, of course, between this and, and common law in a sense, right? Except uh, canon law rests uh, within properly the, the sphere of what the, of ecclesiastical administration, uh, and uh, and therefore aiming at achieving a very different goal than a secular uh, a secular community, and on a much larger scale, right? A universal one. So, uh, such an enormous system, like the church during the 12th or 13th century and so on, needed, uh, importantly, to integrate to the text of the Decretum that had defined, essentially, the law um, of tradition, right? All what had been, because the Decretum is so important, because up to that point, there had been so many other decrees and other, you know, um, uh, rules, right, and, and uh regulations that the church had produced over time because it was already you know that developed before um, uh, to need it and nobody had ever systematized coherently such production up to uh, Gracianus so um, that is the, the milestone right and it was born in fact not surprisingly within the, the moment of the same renewal of the reform uh, of the uh, investiture controversy, so in this moment that, in fact, triggered so much of the recovery of law all over Europe, right, and especially, in fact, Roman law, um, and this um, properly theoretical horizon that looked at the universality right, of, of, a, of a law that had to be, at that point, superior to all the other, the other uh, systems, and that, that the church, both the church and the empire were struggling to, in fact, to, to define, also, uh, integrating e each other's presence, but let's say at the same time clashing in the process. So, um, 
the decretum stood as the the gold standard, right? But other decrees were were uh, were issued. So there had uh, the, what, what we're talking about here in these collections are all appendixes, right, of decretals that uh, completed and updated uh, the, the, the the decretum. For the, so the decretals, the, the decrees that were defined with the adjective extravagantes, given that literally extra decretum vagabanter, that is to say, were it, this would be the, the standard name, right? Because they were properly out, right? The meaning here that they were roaming out of the decretum because they were not part of the same world, right? And, and nobody had, uh, let's say. Uh, at this point, of course, all these decrees had been collected and were studied and, and analyzed in parallel to the decretum and so on. But it was there were there was a bit the same problem that stood before the decretum and other works that tried to 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 make this systematization. It is in fact, of course, as all these other decrees came out, you had to frame them in some other system that that could uh, or in, in the same system, but had that had to be a collection, had to be a a uniformity of interpretation of uh, systematization and so on. So, and as the number of the decretals increased, such appendixes were um, deemed uh, un unsatisfactory, right, by themselves, right, just as an addition, right. And they went on with the collection of autonomous collections of decretals themselves. Um, they started multiplying, especially in the second half of the 12th century, starting from the mm, papacy of Alexander III. They were private works. They they had they were heterogeneous. They were also different size, etc. They were drafted mostly in Italy, France, and England. And in a first moment, they collected the material following a uh, systematic uh, scheme. In fact, that would be soon abandoned though in favor of a chronological one and from this collections we distinguish first of all for the systematic order it was adopted five co um, you know compilations that knew uh, were ha were welcomed quite hardly within the doctrine itself both and and um, and also in the practice right up to the promulgated collection, even as we will see, um, by Pope Gregory the Ninth in 1234. Right. So, in a moment in which the Church now had def defined dramatically, you know, its own role internationally, in which it started to to look at its own production and starting to use it properly as uh, teaching material. Right. Of these same decrees that had come up, you know, up. Uh, come out, uh, you know, after the the decreto, I mean, that now were becoming studying texts themselves. In fact, Gregory the Ninth used widely uh, such uh, material, and such five collections were defined um, as um, the, in fact, the quinque compilaciones antiqua. Right. So even here, they were fixed as what had developed up to that point as this specific five works. So the first compilatio is a um, private collection composed by uh, Bernard of Pavia, who had been a canon law master at Bologna around 1191, which is also titled the Breviarium Extravagantium because it provides often the concise text of the new papal decrees and together with this source uh, that uh, you know there are also uh, you know other um, other um, extracts or say from, from other works such as conciliar canons fathers of the church roman and germanic laws and this is important because it makes you understand of course that these laws a bit like as what was happening in roman law were not being revived just for the sake of you know some kind of abstract definition or laws that were not applied no these things worked heavily were taught and of course they had to be put in parallel to the major uh, you know mm, uh, authorities and legal systems of the time it's obvious that you couldn't really think of canon law without the 
conciliar canons, right? What had been defined during the councils. Same goes for what the fathers of the church had, had said. And also Roman law, as this was being revived, and the Germanic laws that had been, you know, part of the European local uh, juridical systems. We've seen how the same Roman law had fundamentally emerged from the, the Longobardist study. Uh, and, you know, there were, there were Frankish laws, there's feudal laws, and so on. And the texts are uh, in here disposed in a, in a non chronological order, but a systematic one. In fact, they're, they're split in, in, in five books ordered according to the scheme Judex Judicium Clerus Connubian Crimen, that would have been followed by the rest of the Decretals. Um, and this collection, this first collection, had such um, um, had immediate success, right? So um, it, that another um, ed, um, edition would come out in the years 1192, 1198. Then, this, the, 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 there was another um, uh, compilation that is known as the, actually the third, right, that came um, actually before the second, um, in 1209, was completed um, by, uh, essentially, it's a, it's a decretal, uh, it's a collection of Innocent III's decretals, right? So this is so important because, again, this is the acme of papal power, historically. Basically, at this point, there is no kingdom in, in, in Europe that is not vassal of the church, formally. And the um, collection was drafted by the apostolic notary and future car cardinal Peter from Benevent. And it is, um, there is a, a historiographical debate on whether this was a, a private collection um, and, uh, you know, the, or not. Because this, this collection was probably promoted as an official one by the same Innocent III that eventually entrusted the drafting to Peter from Benedict, right? And, and therefore it can stand um, as essentially the first official collection in the history of the church. Um, and think about this, I mean the 13th century is really the opening of, of a new stage of civilizational development in Western history and up to that point things had worked without this mm, kind of, you know, uh, rigid definition fundamentally that or official text and so on. Things had just worked their own. Now, the complexity of the system required a much greater, um, you know, systematization, in fact, logical work, theoretical definition, and and control, especially from, from, from the top. So, um, this collection was even officially sent to the school of Bologna by the Pope with a bull in which um, he granted the authenticity of the text uh, of the decretals that were uh, present in it. This is important because it shows also how easy it was to at that time to counterfeit even the uh, you know public documents. Right, what could really do that? Uh, th th this this was a huge issue in many fields. Thinking even about coinage, about uh, who did write what and from which with which authority, and who could dispatch you know this material for something else. So, um, the authority, the uh, you know the papal authority in this case said you know we defined here publicly that this is you know all all uh, authentic fundamentally, and that we sent this text to be studied in the greatest juridical uh, studium in Europe to probably say, you know, go with this. And so with this initiative, there, there is literally the start of a tradition that will be respected by the popes um, constantly to transmit the official collections of canonic law to the um, juridical studia. Um, and this transmission constituted by itself the publication of the text, right? And under the form of an, uh, literally a direct invitation to the masters to teach law as it had been defined by the papacy and in the terms in which it had been formulated. 
um, it, which reflects, of course, in turn, the uh, authoritativeness recognized not just by the world to, to the church at that point, but by the, the church itself to the juridical doctrine as, as literally the mean for the reception of the norms in, in the praxis. Because, of course, the church was everywhere, right? And, and so, um, a, you know, lay and ecclesiastical authorities constantly uh, interacted in ways that had been defined in part also by canon laws, you know, also Roman law, civil law, let's say, was um, was was issued in, in, you know, just for making s the communities work. Well, the second, com so-called second compilation, Compilatio Secunda, um, is uh, due to John of Wales, was an English master active in Bologna, that um, in fact, as we were saying, even though it, it's chronologically posterior to the third, as it's called, but 1209, well, uh, just about a few years, by the way, because the second is dated to 1210, 1215, right, you know. It, however, contains texts um, preceding um, Innocent III's time. And um, so this is a private collection. Another private collection is the so-called Fort compilation composed by, by John uh, Teutonicus, who in 1216 tried, without success, to obtain for it from, uh, by, by Innocent III, uh, Pope, the approval as official text, right? And the collection was, by the way, mm, preceded by three brief collections by Innocent III that are, um, you know, just telling you how much other work was revolving around. So, in 1226, finally, Pope Honorius III entrusted the Bolognese canonist Tancred to draft a new decretal collection, and thus the Compilatio Quinta, the fifth one as an official collection, was created, was born, um, and sent by the Pope to Bologna, and perhaps also in Padua, where another student had uh, been born there, as well from Bologna, where for its own spread, right? And some of the of these five com compilations were uh, an object of learning and reading from, from, from the side of canonists. In particular, we have numerous uh, glosses to the first one that knew a very important apparatus drafted by uh, Ricardus Anglicus and among the others also the one studied by uh, by Vigan and attributed to the school of Petrus Spirito. while the third the tertia is taken in exam by the Bolognese canonists um, af just after the, the it's um, sent uh, to the sending to the studium as it was uh, enriched by an apparatus of John Teutonicus. Um, so of course, let's say the um, the, the the main goal of the church tradition was the creation of an harmony and, and uh, coherence between the juridical sources that were used and that within such tradition the, the Decretum Graziani uh, essentially centered the uh, scored the, the, the major goal and but this need for for harmony and, and agreement continuous after the decretum in the papal decretals, right? And this need could not be satisfied by the uh, compilations that had been born starting from the last decades of the 12th century that presented this homogeneous uh, and not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, granted as authentic texts, right? And within this frame is 
contextualized initiative of Gregory IX, then in 1230 entrusted the Dominican canonist Raymond de, de Peñafort, this was the you know, counselor of James I of Aragon, to reunite in a single volume systematically ordered and through a, an, an accurate selection and you know, further integrations and, and uh, update the decretals that preceded, uh, uh, let's say, of the previous popes and its all. And with the bull Rex Pacificus, on September the 5th, 1234, Gregory IX sent such collection to the Bolognese studio. And in the same bowl, the Pope, um, um, you know, forbade essentially uh, the um, to to essentially to make reference to other collections. This is also important, as we were saying before, that this surpassed everybody to compose. Um, any other without the consent of the church because so many were writing as we've seen some were written for, for important uh, jurists that however you know once they they went themselves to the Pope to to get the official recognition the Pope said no because there was evidently something in those that didn't quite work the way uh, they were supposed for for papal you know for papal interest and so on and then uh, this broader need of administrative need of, of, of the church and this last volume uh, by Gregory and I w w wasn't really even an of, uh, a precise title right of officially they were known as the decretals of Gregory, Gregory and I but in, in the current language um, it was called like Liber Decretalium Extravagantium or in a you know, shortened form, the Liber Extra, uh, as it would be better known, in fact, eventually. And, um, that is the book in which the, uh, let's say, the, the decretals that Extra Decretum Vagabanter were collected. And the work articulated in five books constitutes, as we were saying, the, the greatest part of the Quinque Compilationes Antiqua some canons, some passages of the Fathers of the Church, some secular laws, and it follows the systematic order started by the Compilatio Prima, this Iulex Judicium Clerus Connubia Crimen, through all the various um, uh, categories. And it is quoted by indicating before the, num let's say, in juridical science, the number of, of the chapter, followed by the 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 X that stands essentially for extra, and then the number of the book, and 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 finally the one of the of the title. And the Liber X is distinguished by the previous um, decretal decretal collections, from one side for its size, uh, from the other to its commitment to reinterpretate and update the tradition, with the end to uh, meet the needs of the judi judiciary practice and and of the doctrine offering a uh, coordinated harmonic uh, text of safe technical and scientific quality say a text defined by papal um, authority pope and just in the same way uh, it had happened for the decretum also the liber extra was immediately an object of learning and interpretation from the side of the jurists the literary form prevailing was um, still a uh, the the glo the glocks right and um, th there are properly decret decretalist glossarists that um, are essentially the canonists that dedicated themselves to the exegesis of such decretal collections to distinguish them from the decretist glossarists there are something slightly different that had essentially studied and interpreted the decretum rather and bernard from parma bernard parma um, drafted a wide apparatus of glosses the um, liber extra uh, to the liber ex in, in 1241 and in 1263 and it terminated another one even more co even a more complete one um, 
and various summa to the liber extra were composed by many jurists, especially famous are the ones of um, Godfrey of Trani and the other one of Henry of Sousa uh, that was the cardinal of, of the suburbicary you know, uh, uh, diocese of Ostia and thus known as Ostiensis was so much appreciated by the you know his contemporaries to deserve the title of Summa Aurea so the golden the best one um, and 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 more uh, numerous are the lecture the readings to the collection of Gregory the Ninth we've seen before among which we remember especially one of Sinibald uh, de Fieschi the future Pope Innocent IV um, from the mm, mid 13th century and the Ostiensis one eventually that was terminated uh, was completed by 1271 uh, so you understand that it was uh, an intense normative activity carried out by the church after the pontificate of Gregory the Ninth through both the decretals and conciliary decisions. By the way, the most important are the ones of Lyon that were held in 1245, 1274. It was also very political in nature, as you know, internationally speaking, the wars. And it, it favored the um, compilation of other uh, collections. Um, and between 1245 and 1280, collections of uh, nove or novelle costituciones were promoted by Innocent IV, Gregory X, and uh, Nicholas III, and they were also interpreted in Glocks, uh, the one of Innocent IV by Bernard of Compostela, and the one of Gregory X by uh, John of Garcia. And at the end of the 13th century, Pope Boniface VIII instituted a commission with the uh, task to draft a collection of those decretals um, followed to the Liber Extra. And the work was completed and promulgated in 1298. It had the title of Liber Sextus, right? So to, 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 to connect the the it, it's uh, it's linked with the liber extra uh that is you know both because it was known as liber but also because as se sexus as sixth um it constituted the, the sixth book of the fifth uh, of the five that were um, with the, the older compilation and the sextus abrogated the collections that had appeared after the pontificate of gregory the ninth um so it, it was in turn, this is interesting, in fact, articulated in five books itself, right? In still with the same order, Eudex, Judicium, Clerus, Conumbia, Crimen. And the sexus is normally quoted by following the criterion uh, of used for for the liber extra, with the the only exception of the substitution of of of, of the um, VI, right? Six to the X. To stress the you know, the X there is not 10, right? It stands for extra, right? You know, instead of here, it's 6, basically, as properly to distinguish it from from the, the Liber X. And the uh, exegetic interpretation of the Sextus was carried out by the canonists belonging to the school of the commentarists, who may say about that, um, and the, um, the, the ordinary... Glocks eventually of this book was composed by um, John Andrea, who was author also of the uh, novella in text that constitutes a uh, more deepened reading of the the work. So the the nature of the liber accent of a sexus has been object of an important historiographical reflection, right? Um, according to which the, conclu uh, uh, the conclusions of which are that the objective of the two popes was not the one um, of a code like the one we intend historically, juridically, not even even to imitate the one of Justinian. Right, their objective was 
really practical was the one of providing norms in texts that couldn't quite be you know equivocated right and and also naturally their their coherence right this the, this harmonic graph thing we have a unitary and logically ordinated content um, which naturally had the broader objective to surpass the multiplicity the subjectivity and the particularity of the norms that were modeled on an interpretive method dominated by doctrine and jurisprudence to give uh, say a broader uh, defini normative definition of the institutions of the rules and it's not a surprise that uh, you know at the acme of medieval civilization the church that was naturally uh, one of the greatest uh, causes of the same um, wouldn't create finally uh, after the high middle ages and this great uh, you know increasing complexity of the system a work that that was meant, of course, to make order, right? To to offer properly a certainty, a stability, a point of reference for the ju for juridical practice, right? These are the works of civilization. If you wonder what these are, you see, we don't teach these things, uh, you know, in schools. We don't teach people to understand what it means to make things work, right? I am surprised whether anybody. Is, is taught history of the church in school today um, which has nothing to do with whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God if you belong to the world you must study the pillars of Western civilization there is no way around that right this is not an alternative a matter of personal opinion something that you can criticize like saying you know but no but it, it, this is exactly what the the basis of our civilizations have been and 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 showing more more than else right an intelligence a capacity a vision a science an understanding a, a concrete application you see uh, i i started talking about history of law from i think was last year and 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 the thing that I remember that because I studied this thing at university as well is, is the, the practicality of this all that that it wasn't being done for some odd ideological reason right that you might say that behind and it was just, this was done in order to facilitate work to make things grow right to make order of course uh, it's not that the church didn't repress at this point but it repressed some you know what was creating disorder and bringing down civilization and again this is something not the, the, the average explanation that you're used to be given right because again of all the possible ideological reasons uh, that go transversally this is not even about being a leftist or an anti-clerical this has to do properly with also coming from a certain cultural background having you know how you you properly see even the middle ages how you see the church uh, the Catholic Church, specifically um, the papacy. Well, these are things that we, I, I think, the, the overwhelming majority of, of the West should be educated from scratch about. I was about to say re educated, but yes, because there is, in fact, this kind of bias. But it, it's properly that there is no, no ground normally, you know, anything is even said about such things. Um, and in this work, but especially the liber sextus is very important, right? Because the liber sec, uh, liber extra is, um, you know, already contained this practical need. But let's say the liber sextus matured it concretely, and it matured at the time of Boniface VIII. Exactly, uh, the the author that that, that um, again, people can't even distinguish today. You know, the, the only thing you hear about Boniface VIII is you know being a, a weak. Uh, individual you find all these stupid openly idiotic YouTube videos pretending to to, to tell you something about history they're just gossiping about uh, you know anti-clerical myths that were constructed um, on the base of what was the standard by the way of political offensive political propaganda that was used by everybody in the same way that transversely for for people to feel better in their uselessness uh, in modern times about people that were dramatically more advanced than them in such a huge figure like Boniface VIII was one of the greatest popes in the history of the papacy one of the most capable practical 
uh, Cold Blood, you know, and produced that much, right? Properly, also in the history of Western education. Think about the University of Rome. Think about, um, you know, something that again people don't even know what it is. They just think he was a depraved individual, because again, they can't even because nobody has even ever told. Let's leave aside what word, what is the historical context and the sources why that was said. But again, you know, what was the standard of political propaganda? In the Middle Ages, it was an extremely refined propaganda, right, for people to still believe in it. But of course, you know, uh, they weren't hoping for that. They weren't searching for that. They were just, um, you know, it, it's just today's people that are not really particularly bright uh, to, to, to distinguish that. But again, the, the point is that they feel so because they want to feel bad. Um, there are many characteristics here is that uh, Liber Sextus is... You know, for example, it's concluded by the regular juris of the uh, juris dino by the from, from uh, of Mugello, right? There. But this is another. We can I think we can skip this aspect because it's yeah they're important, but we should provide other context. And I think we don't have the time. Um, and of course, the Liber Sexus didn't put an end to the drafting of texts of canon law. Right, just things were changing in Europe. Like the 14th century began the contraction of universalism, the decline of the papacy and the empire. Like in 1314, the Pope Clement V uh, ordered the drafting of a collection of decretals post 1298, so after the Liber Sextus. And the work was uh, finished three years later under his successor, John the 22nd. Right, these are also important popes, actually, internationally wide. Um, this work is known as Clementis mm, Pape Quinti Constitutiones, uh, or more briefly, with the more famous title, in fact, of the Clementine, right? Uh, it, sometimes it's even called Liber Septimus, to stress, even in here, the, you know, the epical importance that it had, you know, conceived, have, was conceived like, right, but not quite in the same way. It's different times, different contexts. The um, ordinary gloss to the Clementine is worked again uh, by the jurist uh, John of Andrea. And during the pontificate of John the Twenty Second, it was rather long. Another collection was drafted of the the Pope, the, the his own decretals after thirteen seventeen. Right, there are twenty decretals, or um, ordered in fourteen titles. This is indicated as the um, extravagantes of John the Twenty Second. Fundamentally, he didn't have a um, say um, an official nature in itself. Right, it was um, different. In the fifteenth century, finally, it was a further collection. It was also um, a private one that uh, reunited decor the decretals that had been issued from the time of Boniface VIII to VI to the the, the fourth. It was articulated in five books and indicated with the title of extravagantes communes, which tells you also how, you know, of course, uh, medieval civilization had contracted by that time, still developing, but still with other goals. Now the popes didn't quite have the, had still an, uh, an enormous importance, but not quite the same needs it had had before, so this tradition had kind of made. Um, in, in 1500, the French Jean Chapuis published in Paris the entire collection of the canon collections um, that included the Decretum, the Liber Extra, the Liber Sextus, Sextus de Clementine, the, um, uh, the Extravagantes of John XXII, the Extravagantes Communis, and so on, and he called this the Corpus Juris Canonis. Right, so to stress, of course, with the obvious imitation of the name, the collection of the Codex of Roman Law, um, the the Corpus of Roman Law to to stress the internal uh, coherence, let's say, and to propose the correspondence with Justinian's work, in fact, and the same uh, uh, composition uh, of Corpus Juris Canonici was um, maintained in the following editions. Um, there is naturally a contrast uh, that occurred between the civilists 
the glossarists, especially the, the, the civilist glossarists, in um, uh, allowing, let's say, uh, or accepting, let's say, the canon law as a an element of the scientia juris, which, however, this was initially a two different paths, right? The same civil law had been born out of yes, of, of kind of the, an ecclesiastical form of education, at least, right? That's why how so the university teachers came from originally speak. But this um, this distrust came to came less when um, the decretals were were collected in in such works because. As we've seen, uh, this allowed, we'll say, that there were different new interests now that were ever more intertwined, if you want, between the the secular and ecclesiastical world, right? so that the masters of the Bolognese school now also having been recognized uh, by the Pope as the, the ones which these decretals were issued, right, you know, um, were... Um, you know, were, were involved, in fact, in the same system. And the official collections that were proper of this, uh, the studio of, of law was transmitted for their spread and their theoretical exegesis. The norms of the decretals um, that were inserted in the collections um, entered soon, let's say quickly, uh, since the first five old compilations as to be an object of academic debate to be used in you know publicly in the schools as well. um and it, the 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 first decretalists uh also began to 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 glock them to to comment on them and so this evolution had an important consequence um in in the same development of Roman law, right? Uh which, you know, was fueled of course by what the church also ha had been producing on its own. This is particularly even it's especially in the years uh of of Ogucho from Pisa, uh the time he, he taught in Bologna between eleven seventy eight and eleven ninety. And the um, so this shows how the canonistic science rooted, grafted itself on the civilistic one, drawing from the same the methodological frame, the theoretical uh, deepenings, the literary forms, and in a sense vice versa, because there was never kind of a rigid separation between the environments, between the people, between you know, how these works were produced properly in the first place. And, um, and also, when we speak of canonic law teaching, we know from the oldest surviving statutes of the Bolognese studium, the ones of 1252, that because of the same students' uh, initiatives, um, the same, in fact, canon law had been rigorously disciplined. The masters basically had to attain themselves to a program that indicated for every month the parts of the decretum, and and uh, of which uh, the teaching had to be carried out. So it's important to stress, of course, that universities were born because of private initiatives. So it was the students that went there to learn what they demanded with their corporations and so on. So, and they wanted, they were there to study Roman law, but they studied canon law at the same time. It was imposed to the teachers, um, and the the method was this: like that, every month uh, a punctum, a point, was identified. That is the parameter of verification of the regularity of the teaching. And for every point that was not reached, the master was actually s fine, right? So this is interesting because again, it shows how. The same people who were pioneering juridical studies and that were to be the next generation of jurists, um, of uh, the teacher, that they they 
they they wanted they needed to know uh, canon law right and again for a number of reasons that had to do literally from the fact that the church owned an enormous amount of properties for example that people had to cope with the church that it was in everybody's life at that point I think about the mendicant orders that were created at the time to spread properly in the cities that were the, the same places where you know the the legal studies were emerging had been born right for, for the practical reasons so um, it was a uh, dramatic papal power much money going around the, the, the internationally the, the papacy was allied with some of the greatest powers in Europe uh, such as the kingdom of France so you couldn't quite do without thinking these were too separated it was all part of the same civilization of same culture right and the following Bolognese university statutes dating to 1317 were drafted by the canonist John of Andrea whom um, in that period had um, acquired in the studium a basically an hegemonic position so the same guy who fundamentally commented on on the decretals was at this point you know the most important uh, teacher uh, at Bologna and the same canonist intervened um, authoritatively in the formation also the Bologna sta uh, statutes of 1347 and from the statutes of these 30 years essentially we learn that for teaching canonic law there were uh, essentially two um, paid uh, chairs right an ordinary one for the decretum and an extraordinary one for the decretalis and that this uh, the latter especially was reserved to only to uh, the Bolognese doctors and that the title holder of the teaching of the Sextus was obliged to read also the Clementine right so think at how uh, rooted and uh, omnipresent and um, you know continuous the teaching of canon law was in the lay studium par excellence in Europe right from which the, properly the Roman law had eventually spread toward all, all over Europe where the Bolognese school was the, the model essentially for any other systems also in other countries so think of the impact right that the church had through this teaching at the same time right and any in the as a just as a progress status right of how important the church was in that time in the first place so it's an enormous enormous influence an enormous importance and in and again something that should be definitely borne in mind every time we think of you know the uh, the civil development of medieval Europe that especially in these centuries was was impressed right was dramatically impressed and so for now we stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content and for now I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time bye